Good day, good day, and welcome to Africa Teen Geek. This is the STEM Digital School. If you have just joined in, this is a grade 12 physical sciences class. It's a grade 12 physical sciences class. I am Nongkrile Gumatondo, and I am your teacher for grade 12 physical sciences. Today, today we've got an interesting topic. We're doing the measuring of reaction rate. As you know, we've started with some of our term four work, and we started um, with um, rate of reaction, and now we're moving on to measuring reaction rate. And yesterday we were doing collision of in reaction rate. So it's slowly just building up, and I hope that everybody is understanding the work that is being done so far. Okay, so today this is, is we're doing unit two, which is measured, measuring um, reaction rate. I hope that um, everybody is, is, is quite following through. So um, without any further ado or wasting any more time, Okay, so I'm just having a bit of a challenge with the slide, but I hope that uh, um, we can get it soon enough. Okay, so now we're going to move into the introduction for the measuring of reaction rate. Okay, so what we know is that is that when and in when investigating the factors that affect reaction rate it is vital to make sure that all other factors remain constant okay so basically it means that you need to make sure that um all your measurements are the same in all parts of your experiment okay so what does this mean guys it means that it's very important It's very important that when you inv the investigating factors that affect reaction rate is it's vital to make sure that all other factors remain constant during the course of the experiment. So there's a variety of quantitative measures or methods that can be used. Methods that are chosen depend on the characteristics of specific reaction. So according to whatever reaction you're using, there's a variety of quantitative measures and methods that you can use when trying to see the measures in your reaction rate okay so which means that for example when you have a liquid and you start pouring a substance in it the more substance you put the the more um your your reaction transforms or becomes faster so it's always important that you have the right measurement of your reactants and to to, to make sure that you reap the product that you require so what when gas is formed in a reaction we can measure the rate of gas liberated by determining the change in volume of gas formed in time. So what this means is that um, when you, you want to measure a gas, the reaction rate is determined by the change in gas formed with the time. So it means that this is a reaction that occurs slowly um, up until it is full, 
fully done or for example up until you get the maximum um, reaction rates that this reaction can produce okay so some reactions form products that cause the change in color what does this mean for example like i just mentioned to you you might have a certain substance, substance x that you're putting on a solution y so the more you put the substance maybe it will start changing color it starts by being a little bit um gray the more you put your substance it starts becoming um it starts becoming blue and eventually it becomes dark blue so it always depends on your reaction and how much you are using there for it to change okay so we measure the intensity of the calorimeter or spectrophotometer so this means that we always determine the amount of the measure according to the intensity or the changes that we can observe visually or that we can measure using our um, mechanisms that we use to measure whether it's a calorimeter or a spectrophotometer so other reactions form precipitates precipitates right what does this mean guys that it means that um there is little particles that remain behind when your experiment is being done there we can we measure the turbidity which is the amount of solids produced or formed over time so it differs guys sometimes we need to measure the gas that is formed and in other times we need to measure the amount of solid products that are formed so it's two ways things that we can use so we can either have precipitates or we can have gas that is formed over time and that is what we're going to measure our reaction with okay so moving through then now we're going to start with measuring volume of gases what does this mean guys how the average rate of a reaction is measured depends on what the reaction is the reactants and products that are formed therefore okay so a reaction is based on the reactants and products that are formed okay do you guys understand if you don't understand you can just send me a chat and i'll explain a reaction depends a reaction um, when you define a reaction it, it, it it's basically the reactant so in every experiment there's a specific way in which the reaction was measured okay so which means that it's either you measure your reactants that you have used or you you measure the amount of product that is formed one of the two has to be measured so in in this case when you we, we want to measure the volume of gas it means that we are measuring the product if we have an experiment where, whereby there's a product that is formed as ga a gas that needs to be formed as part of the product we need a certain way in which we're going to measure this gas so the volume of gas produced in a reaction may be measured by collecting the gas in a syringe okay so you see here this is our syringe and this is the reactant this is the gas that is formed there so what happens is it's going to move in there and this is what you're going to measure you're going to measure the gas in the syringe so as the more the, the more gas is produced the plunger can be pushed out so that the volume of gas can be recorded in the syringe this is the plunge okay so the plunge starts from here so while the gas moves into this tube then the plunger gets pushed back up until the end of the amount of measures that has been collected here in the syringe okay so a graph can be plotted by measuring the volume of gas at a certain time interval so what does this mean guys it means that when you're doing your experiment and you have your gas that's moving into the syringe what we can do we can make it time your sleep we can say you're checking how much the syringe is after for example an interval of one meter once i mean um 30 seconds so which means that at every 30 seconds you're gonna go and take a reading on your series after 30 seconds you take a reading on your series after 30 seconds you take a reading on your series and that if you have different plots like this therefore you can plot a graph and this graph will be something like this this graph is going to be your volume of gas um, over time, right? So, which means that at, at 30 seconds, for example, you have two centimeter cube. 
and it continues like that. And you can see that this graph, it forms a gradient that is in this, in this form. Okay. So the steep gradient starts at, starts at, at start fastest react. It starts at a faster reaction rate. So the gradient decreases with time as reaction rate slows down. So the gradient becomes zero and shows that the reaction has stopped, which means there is no more gas produced. So here, when it starts, you can see it's moving straight up. Why is that so? Because there's still a lot of reactants and the reaction is moving at a very fast rate. That's what it means here. That's why it's moving steeply up. But as you see, as the as a time continues, um, our reaction rate starts slowing down and it starts reacting at a slower rate, which means that our reactants are reaching equilibrium where they can no longer form, form or give any product. But as the time goes, you will see that it becomes a straight line. Why is it a straight line? Because there's no more gas that is being produced, which means that our reactants have been used up in the reaction and there's no gas that is any more produced. Okay. So moving on. So we, we also have examples of these reaction rates. So example of reactions that, that produce gas are as follows. The first one, we're going to have reactions that produce hydrogen gas. So when a metal reacts with an acid, hydrogen gas is produced, okay? So there you have it. It's a metal um, with a solution. It produces a hydrogen gas over here. So a lint, a lint sprint is used to test for hydrogen, okay? So basically, this is something similar to the experiment that we just did now that showed in a glass tube and you have, for example, a syringe where you are extracting the hydrogen gas to see how much there is. Okay, so an example is the magnesium reacts with sulfuric acid to produce magnesium sulfate and hydrogen. So this is a similar one. So which means that in your syringe as well, you'll be measuring in time intervals how much gas is produced um, in this reaction, okay? So we've got another example, which is reactions that produces carbon dioxide, okay? So when, carbon, carbonate, when a carbonate reacts with an acid, carbon dioxide gas is produced. When, a, when carbon dioxide is passed through lime water, it turns the lime water into a very milky substance, okay? So a burning splint will also stop burning in the presence of carbon dioxide. These are some of the tests that produce carbon dioxide. So that includes, um, remember we spoke about combustion. So once you see the burning sign, you know they're talking about a combustion reaction where carbon dioxide gas is formed. Okay, so an example will be the reaction when calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid um, react together to produce calcium chloride water and carbon dioxide but we always know guys in a um, combustion reaction our product always has um, water and carbon dioxide so this is a typical example as well of reaction that produces gas okay so moving on we've got the third one as well so these are reactions that produce oxygen so we, 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 we've had an example of a reaction that produces hydrogen gas we had an example of a reaction that produces carbon dioxide, and now we have a reaction that produces oxygen. So hydrogen peroxide decomposes. So you see what's happening here. So decomposition reactions are ones that are likely to produce oxygen. So in the presence of manganese oxide catalyst to produce oxygen and water, we have a reaction of this nature. This is a decomposition reaction, okay? So we're going to do a small activity. This is an activity that we get from our textbook. I hope that we will be able to open the textbook. Here we are. Okay. So this is a, this is a reaction that I want us to work through. Okay. Because it's important, guys, as much as we're not doing physical experiments, but there are certain experiments that you guys need to slowly start to understand how they are done, okay? So it says here, the magnesium reaction. It says magnesium ribbon reacts with 
hydrochloric acid to release hydrogen gas. Remember, we spoke about hydrogen gas as our first types of reactions that release gas. So this is an example that we're going to use. We can use the volume of gas released in a certain time period to measure the rate of the reaction. So in this experiment, we will measure the effect of the concentration on rate of reaction and plot a graph of rate of reaction against time. Remember, we've already explained how that gets to be done. So this is what we're going to need. We're going to need a conical flask with delivery tube through a bunch, a gas syringe, which is this one, diluted hydrochloric acid, magnesium ribbon, cleans, and, and of similar length, and a stopwatch or a timer. What are we going to need a stopwatch or a timer for? Two, when we start measuring on our series, our results, we're going to do it in time interval. Okay. So the plunger moves out when the reaction starts. So when the reaction starts, you need to have your timer and you need to start jotting your results as they come along. Okay. So we've got our magnesium ribbon here and excess, which is the reactant as well that is dissolving in the hydrochloric acid. So this is our hydrochloric acid and this is our flask as you guys can see it here. So what is the method that we're going to use for this experiment? The table, the table below contains instructions for the different experiments. So the first one, you're going to copy the table for recording your results, okay? You're going to set up the apparatus as shown in the diagram, which is this one. Then you remove the bunch and put one piece of magnesium ribbon into the flask. Pour 50 centimeter cube um, of hydrochloric acid and replace the bunch immediately, okay? So which means that now it's closed, it's ready for your um, reaction to take place. So now that the, this um, bung is, is, is closed up, your reaction starts taking place, right? So you're going to record the volume of gas in the series every 10 minutes. So the time interval in this case is going to be 10 minutes. So you're going to repeat the procedure for experiment two and record the results. You're going to plot the graph of hydrogen gas collected against time for both experiments, draw both curvatures of the same set of axes and on the graph paper. So now these are the following answers that we're going to need to answer. Now you answer the following question. Number one, why is an excess of magnesium used? Number two, why do the reactions slow down after a few minutes? Number C, why will the reaction eventually stop? And number D, explain the difference between one and two. Okay. So let's go to our answers. Okay. So this is our volume of HCl and there it's volume of H2O. So what does this mean, guys? It means that the experiment, for the first time, they put hydrochloric acid with excess magnesium. For the second experiment, they put H2O, which is water, with the same um, volume of 50 centimeter cube, and they put the excess of magnesium. So it's same setup, but different solutions that are used to react with the magnesium ribbon. Okay. So there we have it. Um, you write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction. So this is what we're going to do. Okay. So let's start with number A. Okay. Let's start with number A, where they ask, why did they use Okay, let me just go to our answers. Okay, so this is an activity where we're doing a virtual experiment. Okay, so the magnesium reaction. They're asking why is an excess of magnesium used in this reaction? So here, the factor of concentration is examined. An excess of magnesium is used to ensure that there is enough magnesium to sustain the reaction until all the hydrochloric acid is used up, okay? So there was a question that I was asking, why is an excess of 
magnesium used. So what does an excess of magnesium used mean? It means that they used a lot or a high number of magnesium to make sure that it's going to be enough to sustain the reaction until the hydrochloric acid is used up. Because if they use less, then eventually um, the reaction is going to reach equilibrium and no reaction will take place because the magnesium will be used up and we'll only have the hydrochloric acid left okay so that's what it means they when they ask why is an excess of magnesium used then we go back oh i think i'm i'm far ahead now we are on we are on activity four so guys this activity i'm taking it from the study and master textbook okay so let me just remember what the question said because our book is taking its time to open up oh here we are so now they ask on number b why do the reactions slow down after a few minutes okay remember we also spoke about that when we when I was explaining the graphs and how they move and how they slowly start decreasing, it says on number B, the reactions slow down after a few minutes because the reactants are being used up and the product is being formed. So slowly in the beginning of the reaction, the reaction is going to be fast because there is excess of reactants and that are used being, in this case, the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid. But as time goes, as the minutes move by, we slowly start to see the reaction slowing down as the amount of gas that is being produced is being less. And why is that? That's because the reactants are being used up and the product is formed. So it's reaching the end of the, of the reaction. So the concentration of the reactants slowly starts decreasing. Okay. Okay. I hope that that makes sense. And then we move on to the next question, which asks, why will the reaction eventually stop? What did you say? Why will the re um, reaction eventually stop? If you guys remember from what I've explained is that eventually, remember, the reaction starts at a fast rate, but slowly starts slowing down as the reactants get used up and eventually it comes to a stop. Okay. And why is that? The reaction will eventually stop when the acid is completely used up so that means there is nothing more to react because all of our reactant is used up and our acid is used up which is our hydrochloric acid okay so that is what they mean there. okay so moving on to the next question which says that explain the difference between curve one and curve two what is curve one and curve two guys curve one and curve two remember we've got two experiments that has been done here the first one is one way we have the same setup with the magnesium ribbon but we have hydrochloric acid as our solution and on the second one we've got water which is h2o as our solution so now they want us to explain the difference between the two graphs okay so let's go to the graphs. Okay. So you see the graphs. This is one, two, and three. Okay. So the curve one is steeper than curve two because the acid concentration in one is higher than two. Obviously, acid is much um, is, is much stronger than normal water. So that's why it's got a steeper um, curve than the one for number two. So the third so these are the graphs as we see them, okay? These are graphs that is probably the one of hydrochloric acid and is the other one for water, okay? So I see that the third one, the third graph was the one for powdered magnesium, okay? So here they only explain to us that we have having two experiments, but we didn't really... Um, Get into detail with the one with the powdered experiment, okay? Because here, as you can see, the 
volume of HCl, the volume of H2O. Okay. So what, what it says here is that um, curve one, which is the one of the hydrochloric acid, will be much steeper because it's, it, it, the acid um, reacts much faster with the magnesium than H, the normal H2O. Okay. So that's what it means. So on number E, they say, imagine that the conditions of the experiment run were repeated, but magnesium powder with a similar mass was used instead of a magnesium ribbon. Draw a third line on your graph to show the result you would expect and explain your decision. Okay. So which means that now, instead of using a ribbon or a solid uh, magnesium, we use magnesium powder and i believe that magnesium powder will burn much faster because um it's it's much lighter okay so the third line on the graph should be much steeper because the reaction rate for powder magnesium will be much faster than a magnesium ribbon which makes sense because a magnesium ribbon is a solid substance and it will take much more time for it to break down but because a powder substance is used a powder would be already powdered and it's, it's much faster for the reaction to take place because it, it, it doesn't need to break down before it actually commences with the reaction. Okay. I hope that all of this makes sense to you guys. I know that the experiments are very interesting and sometimes we really don't need to have physical ones to understand the concepts around our experiments. Okay. So on number F, On number F, it says that write a balanced equation for the reaction, okay? So now we need to write a balanced equation for the reaction, which means it's a reaction between hydrochloric acid and magnesium, okay? So we don't have a lot of time anymore. Our time is almost up, but at least we've managed to do some of this work, okay? So here is our... Here is our um, balanced equation. It's going to be magnesium solid plus hydrochloric acid gives you uh, magnesium chloride plus hydrogen gas. So you get to balance it out by putting a 2 in front of the HCl and our equation is therefore balanced. Guys, this was a great experiment. I hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Okay. I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. So um, let's see another problem that we're going to have, okay? Okay. So let's move on. So now we're going to do some more tests. We're going to do some more tests. So the first question says for us, Rank the following reactions in order of increasing rate. Okay. We're going to rate, rank the following reactions in order of increasing rate. So the first one we've got sodium hydroxide neutralizing hydrochloric acid. Number two, number B, we've got rotting wood. Number C, we've got milk turning sour. And number D, we've got an egg cooking in boiling water. Okay. So, the order of increasing rate will be this one. Number A will be the rotten wood. Number B will be the milk turning sour. Number C would be an egg cooking in boiled water. And number D would be... So, so, this would be the order of increasing rate. So, the fastest rate would be the hydrochlor hyd sodium hydroxide neutralizing hydrochloric acid and the rotting wood takes time, guys. As you guys know, it takes time for wood to rot. So it would take a number of days. But for sodium hydroxide to be neutralized, to neutralize hydrochloric acid, that would take um, much faster time. It would take a number of minutes or even less than an hour for that reaction to reach completion. And an egg cooking in boiling water, that one, it would also take a number of minutes, but it's not as fast as number D, which is sodium hydroxide neutralizing hydrochloric acid. Now, an egg cooking in boiling water would probably take about um, an, a 20 minutes or so. 
for that to happen. Okay, so this one, milk turning sour. Milk turning sour, um, that one, it takes probably like two days. Okay, so more or less two days for that um, to happen or two to three days that would happen. But rotting wood, rotting wood takes about weeks or even months. So this one basically was just a, an exercise just to test your general knowledge because this is basically general knowledge. You would know that a rotting wood takes very long um, to ha happen compared to any reaction that you can do in an experimenting class or in egg cooking over boiling water or even milk turning sour. This doesn't take a day, but this takes about hours. So this would be our order of increasing rate. Okay. So let's move to number two. Number two says zinc and sulfuric acid react to produce zinc sulfate and hydrogen. Okay. So this is what this is is forming a hydrogen gas, which means that it's it's similar to the reaction that we just did now, where we had um, magnesium and hydrochloric acid. But this time we've got zinc and sulfuric acid. So what they want us to do first, they want us to write a balanced chemical a balanced equation for this reaction. So we'd have zinc and SO4 um, will give you um, zinc sulfate, SO3, I think, and hydrogen. But let's, we're going to see it now. And then number B is going to say, name the reactants. And number C says, name the product. So just by looking at the reaction here, we already know that our reactant is going to be the zinc and sulfuric acid and our product is going to be our zinc sulfate and our hydrogen okay so let's go and check out how we write a balanced chemical equation so this would be our balanced chemical equation okay so it's going to be zinc plus h2so4 um, will give us znso4 plus hydrogen gas. Do you guys see this? Okay. Does it make sense? Because this is our sulfuric acid and this is our zinc and this is our product. So it seems like our equation here is balanced. We don't need to balance it because it's already balanced. Because you know, the minute they say produces hydrogen, you know it's a gas. Hydrogen doesn't stand alone. It's going to be H2. And don't forget guys to name them according to solid, aqueous, aqueous, and gas, okay? So they wanted to know on number B, what is our reactants? Our reactants in this case is our zinc and H2SO4, which is our sulfuric acid. So these form part of our reactants. And then on number C, it says the product. The product is gonna be our zinc sulfate and our hydrogen gas. So this is our balanced chemical equation, okay? So moving on to number D, okay? The rate of reaction can be represented by the graph on the left, okay? So number D says, give possible reasons for the increase in reaction rate in A before T1, okay? So here is our graph right here. So volume of H2 gas re released and the rate in which it is released. So they want to know there. Give possible reasons for the increase in reaction rate in A before T1. So here's our T1 and here is our graph A, the green one that is over here. So they'd want, they want to know, give a reason for the increase. Okay, so this is nothing new. It says here, the zinc may have a layer of impurities, dirt, and oxides on its surface that must be removed first. This is an exothermic reaction and as the reaction progresses, the temperature increases, so will the rate of reaction. So we always know that in the first part, um, the reaction rate usually is much faster and increases drastically because there is a lot of reactants that is still present. But here they say the zinc may have a layer of impurities that must be removed first. So this is an exothermic reaction. As the reaction progresses, the temperature increases and so will the rate of 
reaction. Okay. I hope that that makes sense. So it says on number two, give a possible re reason for the decrease in reaction rate on A after T1. Okay. So there is our reaction rate. This part here from here going up, the reaction rate starts slowly decreasing. Why does it mean? It means that our reactants are getting used up and the reaction is the product is getting formed completely. Okay. So let's hear what it says here. It says that the acid concentration decreases as more product forms and the zinc surface area decreases as it is used up. So which means that in this case, our reactants are getting used up and our product is getting formed. So the reaction starts getting slower because we do not have a lot of access of reactants to use for the reaction. Okay. So let's move on to number F. Number F says a second experiment was performed using a different sample of zinc and a different sample of sulfuric acid. Okay. So this is the second one that's performed. So if, for example, for the first one, we use 10 gram of zinc and 10 centimeter cubed of sulfuric acid, this time we'll probably use 15 um, grams of zinc and 50 um, uh, solution of sulfuric acid. So they say the mass of zinc and the same mass of zinc and the same volume of sulfuric acid were used. Okay. So the result of this experiment is given by curve B. Was the reaction rate of B higher or lower than A? So a second experiment was performed using a different sample and a different sample of um, sulfuric acid. They say the same mass and the same volume were used, however. So it's just a different one that was done on the side. So the results are given as curve B. Was the reaction rate of B higher or lower than the reaction at A. But as you can see here, it looks like the reaction was much higher than the one of A, okay? The, the reaction on B was much higher than the reaction at A. So let's see. The reaction rate at B is higher than that of A, okay? So they wanna know Mention the possible factors that could have contributed B. So this is our experiment B, the red line, and this is our experiment A. So they want to know what are the factors that could have contributed. So it says here on G, more concentrated acid was used and the reaction was carried out at a higher temperature and the zinc was powdered. So those are possible reasons why this reaction could have been much different than the other one. Maybe the previous one, the zinc was not powdered. It was a normal solid zinc that was used. But in this case, it was powdered zinc and more concentrated acid was used. As much as they used hydrochloric acid, but maybe the concentration of the hydrochloric acid was more than the one on A. And the reaction was carried out at a higher temperature. Because you know, if you use the first experiment, you try and um, change the conditions around it for it to give you a much faster result. So this is what um, was done in this reaction. I hope that this makes sense to you guys, okay? So which means that here, factors that could have contributed um, um, for B to be much higher than A is number one, um, the, the hydrochloric acid was more concentrated than the one that they used at B. Number two, it could be that because here they might have used a solid um, zinc particle, but in this case, they are using a powdered zinc solution in the solution, okay? And then number three is that um, the temperature could have also been changed. For A, maybe the temperature was lower, but for B, then they might have increased the temperature for, to, to make sure that we have a faster chemical reaction. So those are the two things that could have been done, okay? So we're almost done, guys. 
Now we come to number three. Number three says the graphs show the results of five experiments in which hydrochloric acid reacts with marble chips. So the details of the experiment are given in the table. Okay. Five experiments uh, react with marble chips. Okay. So this is the different volumes that we used. Okay. So number one is 60. Number two is 30. So these are the volume of the acid. But I think the marble chips remain very constant. So these ones were the whole, um, these ones, which means whole in this case means that the solid um, rock or, or, or substance of the marble. But on number five, we see that here it was powdered. Okay. Guys, you must always remember if you also want to increase the rate, you can powder the, the solid substance in order for your reaction to be more faster, or you can um, make the concentration much, um, you can make the solution more concentrated, or you can change the temperature. If you increase the temperature, then the reaction will also take place much quicker. Okay, so we see here, this is what we have. So we've got all our volumes right here, and we've got the temperature. The, diff the temperature is almost consistent, but here it was decreased. So now they say match the graphs to the experiment and give a reason for your answer. Okay, I wish that I could have. Graph B, experiment one. A, B, C, D, E. Okay, I think the graphs here, um, this is what we would get. Let me just see, guys. I think that um, the graph is not part. Let's just go and see the graph quickly. Okay, so this was our first problem. So let's go to I'm just looking for the second graph. There we are. So this is our graph right here. So now they want us to match the graph with the different particles there. Okay, so there we have it. You've got that one there which is A, this one is B, this one is C, this one is D, and this one is E, okay? So how are we going to match these graphs? You see what we've done here? This is our table. Um, so which means that graph A will be experiment one, two, three, four, as consecutively. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into detail with it because we don't have a lot of time. Um, experiment one to five, here the effect of surface area was tested. All other factors were the same. The powder marble will react faster than a whole marble. Experiment two to three, here the effect of temperature was tested, okay? So experiment two was done at a lower temperature and will react much slower. Experiment one, five and two and three and four contains decreasing amount of acid. So one and five have the largest amount of acid and will release the most gas. So four contains the smallest amount of acid and will release the smallest amount of gas, okay? So they also wanna know which factors is the same in every experiment. In this case, um, the acid concentration is the same in all the experiments. So we all had the same um, amount of concentration for the whole experiment. But that's what needs to be done in order to see and to know the, there's, there's, a, there's a variable that always has to be constant in all of them to be able to test um, their reaction and know that it's all standard reactions. Okay. So on number EC, it says, which reaction finished first? 
the more the reaction in experiment four is the one that finished first. Okay. So guys, thank you guys so much. Um, this was a beautiful class. Thank you for taking part in it. Um, my name is Donkulia Gomatondo. I am your grade 12 physical sciences teacher. And thank you so much. And if you have any other query with regards to the problem that we did today, you can get me on t 3 at gmail.com. And you can ask me any questions related to the topics that we're doing at the moment. Thank you guys so much and goodbye.